Why did you move so quickly to introduce issues like a new flag and a republic so early in the piece? Well, part of it came with the Queen's visit. She came in February. I mean, I, I had all of these visitors, you know, the President of the US, so quickly after I became Prime Minister, and as it happened, a, a, a well-planned visit by the Queen. And you might have noticed that the Liberal Party, when I made the speech, which was unexceptional, about saying that we have to be a more independent state, just as Britain finds its place in the European Union, in its construct with Europe, we too have to find our place in this part of the world. And the links between us will change. And, and, the, and the sort of cultural loyalties to the monarchy will change. Well, the Liberal Party were outraged. You know, those lick spittles, uh, Hewson, Howard, all the rest of them, uh, were up there saying this was a terrible way I, I had been. I didn't know my place and I hadn't shown a sufficient respect to the Queen. The Queen, of course, was fine about all this. No problem at all. Uh, so then I then lifted the bar on them. I said, well, you know, you're the same people who went and took your knighthoods from them after they left us with the fall of Singapore and sought to divert our troops to the Middle East and left us in jeopardy. You know, when does it ever occur to you people that we ought to be pursuing our own independent foreign policy. And, and the opportunity today is even more profound, Kerry. You look at Australia now with, I mean, 20, 20 odd years ago, you, you know, you need a microscope to find the Chinese economy. You know, look at it now. It's the second largest economy in the world. Look at East Asia, look at the growth. 70, 67% of world growth is coming out of our region, 67. So, and you can see the great trade we've got ourselves in natural gas, iron ore, coking coal, all these minerals and everything else. But, but at what point do we decide that we want to be a multicultural cosmopolitan place? At what point do we decide we want to be in it? At what point do we cut the knot on the monarchy? I mean, look at all the tomfoolery about the British monarchy and about, about Prince William and the, and, 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 and the, uh, uh, and the heir, you know, I mean, the, the poor Brits, if they want to go down that sad road, let them, but let's get out of it ourselves. In late 93, uh, the committee you set up to advise on a framework for a republic came up with the view that the head of state should be elected by the parliament rather than the public, which was also your view. Yeah. Isn't that still the fundamental stumbling block to a republic in Australia today? that the Republican, remove, uh, the Republican movement is split down the middle between those who want a popularly elected president, and that includes most of the populace, and those who trust a vote of the parliament rather than the people. Well, you know, Kerry, by 1994, I had a 63% vote in favour in polls for the Republic. You know, I'd taken it on and taken the risk at the 93 election of making it a major piece of the party manifesto and platform. By 94, this is up to 63%. I offered John Howard and Downer, who was then leader, a model the Liberal Party could accept. Yeah? When, I, when I called Howard on the phone to tell him I was going to give him notice as opposition leader that I was going to announce in the House of Representatives a model for the Republic in 1995, he interrupted me in the middle of the conversation and said, I hope you're keeping, I hope you've got the head of state appointed by the parliament. I said, no, John, I have, I have. I have. Good, good, good. See, Howard lost Australia the opportunity of becoming a republic through, through contrived, contrived events around that referendum of his. If they'd have put the single question, do you think Australia should become a republic, it would have been overwhelmingly agreed. Then we could have got to the model. But the moment you go to an elected president, let me go to that point, the moment you go to an elected president, the power will devolve to the elected person more than anyone in the cabinet. Shortly after that report by your uh, Republican Headed committee, by Malcolm Turnbull. Shortly after that uh, report, you met the Queen in England and briefed her on the Republic. Yeah. Was she amenable to the idea? And she were you there. able to have a natural conversation? I was. Her? I had it in the, the, the drawing room at Balmoral. She told me it had been her grandmother's favourite room, Mrs Queen Victoria's room. It still had the original tartan carpets and 
the faded furniture and looked out over the hills and we discussed the furniture and the carpet and the decoration and all that. And then I went through the, the reasons why Australia had reached the point where it had to make a choice about its future. Its future as an independent country in Asia or in the Asian construct, not an Asian country by the way, let's make me clear about that, Australia can only be Australia, not Asian. Uh, but, but where I believe when she came, returned to Australia, not as Queen of Australia, but as Queen of Great Britain, there would be even more warmth displayed towards her than the ambivalence now about her having been Queen of Australia. And while she didn't concur in that expressly, she said, well, I'll always my family has always tried to do the right thing by Australia and of course I will take the advice of Australian ministers. In other words, she was the perfect constitutional head of state in making those remarks. And I said, well look, normally after these sort of meetings the protocol is we all say nothing. But on this occasion I think it's better if I say what you've said. So she discussed this with her private secretary, Sir Robert Fellows, and they agreed that I should say this later. So I think that the royal family had come to the conclusion that Australia would become a republic and almost the quicker the better. In fact, Prince Charles said almost that when he came to Sydney in 1994. You know, uh, you know what are you dallying about? What are you dallying about? And of course, Prince Philip, when the referendum was defeated, Mr Howard's referendum was defeated, Prince Philip is supposed to have said to friends, don't those Australians know what's good for them? Now, I don't know whether he said it, but look, I'd be certain, as certain as we're sitting here, that the British royal family believes we'd all be better off with them as the former relatives and us as an Australian republic. Now, I guess it was one thing for you to float this as a part of what you saw as an important direction for Australia to head in, but um, it was quite another to decide that you were going to firmly place it on the political agenda and make it a real political issue. Even your own office, when I read through the records, even your own office was divided on yeah, this, yeah. on the focus that you wanted to put on it. Yeah, well, they're called risks, and you take risks and you burn up capital to get, the, to, do, to get the nation set properly. And I was prepared to take the risk in that poll in 1993. And this gets back to what I say about leadership and what I saw as a different kind of leadership which the country needed, not the consensual leadership, not the consensual model. Now, your critics would say that you were most particularly wanting to look for diversions to draw people's attention away from the economy, which was still very deep into the after effects of the recession, unemployment was continuing to climb in a bad way. Uh, and I wonder, coming to the election, hmm. you're promising a referendum. Uh, I just wonder how many Australians actually voted with that in mind. Look, I've been fighting economic arguments for that stage a dozen years and ten years, Kerry. I didn't need diversions, you know. The Liberal Party hated my my, if you like, geopolitical and social program. They hated, they wanted to stick with the Menzian model. You know, here we were, good little Anglophiles, you know, waving our little royal flag, which had the Union Jack in the corner, all bowing to the Queen, and, uh, you know, and our future was guaranteed by the United States Navy, and we don't do anything else, and we can just be a whole lot of safe little people. You know, they hated my stuff. but but. But you see, you are nobody until you attract a good stock of enemies. That's, that's, the other, that's the other point. I don't know that you go out of your way to create them. Well, you certainly don't blunt the policy to, to appease them. Also early in 94, your push for a republic got an unexpected boost from Prince Charles. It did, indeed. When he visited uh, in January and described the debate, the republic debate, as a sign of a mature and self-confident nation. He even hinted at support. Uh, perhaps you're right, he said. Now, you described uh, what he had to say as a bit of a wink and a nod. I thought it was. He said he thought it was a sign of Australia's maturity 
that it should that it should think about changing its institutions. Well, if that's not a wink and a nod, I don't know what was. Um, what sort of help was it? Oh, I thought it was a big help, actually. You see, I'd say, had Labor won the 1996 election, then we would have gone to the referendum and we would have had a republic. Uh, as it turned out, John Howard won. He had a convention, buried it, finally had a referendum and it lost. But uh, I've always puzzled about why you wouldn't have taken a simple proposition to a referendum at the 1996 election, because you would have known that the chances of your re-election were, uh, at best, not great. No, but at the same time, it had to be a, a bipartisan measure. So I established the Republic Advisory Committee in 1993, under the leadership of Malcolm Turnbull, which included people like Nick Greiner from New South Wales, uh, Maurice Payne, other people in the Liberal Party, along with people sympathetic to the government. Um, and those recommend All Republicans. Yeah, all Republicans. But those recommendations then became the basis for the proposals I put to the House of Representatives in 1995. Um, so in other words, I was not going to do something tricky I'd said at the 93 election, I think it's, it's worth saying this, I was the only party leader, and so far at this point in Australia's history, to actually propose in a policy speech that Australia should move to a republic. And having won the election with that as part of the manifesto, I then did what I said I'd do, established a bipartisan committee, they went round the country, reported to the government, and then I said we would consider their report, act upon it, and and not at some press conference outside of the parliament, but in the parliament, make a speech with a full model of a movement to a republic. And I did that, of course, uh, in 1995. Now, I think if I'd have tried to then squeeze in, you know, concertina it all, squeeze in a referendum at the 96 poll, I wouldn't have had the Liberal Party with me and we would have gone down. And the model that I chose was one I thought the Liberal Party would accept and adopt, and I designed it such, particularly in the advice, in the light of the advice from the Republic Advisory Committee. But it, so it was, it was utterly minimalist, really, wasn't it? It you was. You were even going to still call it the Commonwealth of Australia yeah. rather than the Republic yeah. of Australia. It, it was minimalist. It was a change to an Australian head of state. Um, the reserve powers remained with the head of state. Uh, the Senate maintained its powers to block supply, which the Liberals always wanted. The Liberal Party in, uh, you know, both, uh, certainly John Howard, would have preferred that the Parliament nominate the head of state and not be popularly elected. Mm -hmm. I had all of those features, so I went out of my way. In fact, Malcolm Turnbull made a statement the day after the debate in the House of Representatives saying that I had put a proposal without any political barbs, without any, without any preference, without any partisanship, in other words, one the opposition could adopt. So the reason I think, the, the answer to your question, the reason we wouldn't have had a referendum in 96 is that I had to have the Liberal Party really on side to make this work. And, and, and I, couldn't, I wouldn't have done it concertinaing it. Into, into that term. Mm. Do you accept this, though, as a bottom line proposition? Both parties were divided when it actually did go to, uh, to a constitutional convention uh, and then to a referendum. The Liberals were split between a republic and a monarchy. Yeah. Labor was split between a popularly elected president uh, and one elected by the parliament, yeah. uh, as was the public. Do you accept that, uh, that unless there is a united Republican movement on one model, it's never going to get up? Well, you've got to accept this point, I think. You must have the Prime Minister really barracking for the thing. You see, the problem with... But in, you need more than that. Yeah, you yeah, need okay, the states yeah, on yeah, side. Yeah, you need, true. You need people singing to one song on what kind of Republican. But you had no chance in the Howard referendum when the Prime Minister himself was really silently barracking for a monarchy and not putting the case for the appointed, the parliamentary appointed 
or nominated head of state. So but, but, if, but if look, the, in, in, yeah. honestly, in fairness, yeah. uh, if the shoe had been on the other foot, yeah. and it was John Howard who'd framed the debate, mm. and you then beat him in an election, and you inherited that, you'd have thrown his out the window and fashioned your own. Well, just it, as he did with yours. Well, I don't think I would have if I would have done this at, if it had been the same model, because I thought it's imperative that Australia move to a republic. Mm. You know, it's imperative the parties agree to support it at a referendum. You see, th th there's no there's no history of success in referenda in Australia, where the prime minister, the head of the executive government, isn't barracking for it. So if the prime minister's not barracking for it, forget it's it. Dead, it's, dead not gonna it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen.